Hello? Maybe just the touch of a hand. Hey, everybody. How are you? Thank you for playing, Ed. I love that song. Oh, wonderful song. Wow, that went off Hello. very quickly. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our great edition here of Deborah Cobalt Live. We have a terrific show for you today. Uh, I'm just going to get right to it because on the phone, and we can't wait to talk to him, is John Gray. Everybody knows John Gray. In case you don't recognize his name, he is the author of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Thank you so much for being here, John. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Okay. John, of course, has a new book out. It's called Beyond Mars and Venus, New Relationship Skills for a Complex World. Isn't that the truth, huh? I mean, I can't even, you know, I can't imagine what it's like out there being, out there dating. So, um, John, let's get right to it. How the heck did you do the, your research for that incredible book, your first round back in 1992, um, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus? I mean, it's a classic. I think um, it's in how many countries? 145 languages, 100 different countries it's been read. It's a classic. Everybody knows your book. I'm honored to have you on the show, actually. But where would you do all your research from? Well, I was, I'm was i still a marriage counselor. I was a marriage counselor for 10 years before I wrote that book. and particularly then, everybody was trying to, you know, equality was the big theme, but equality doesn't mean sameness. Mm -hmm. So people wanted to be closer, more equal. That requires new relationship skills, and the first step of that is understanding where we're coming from. And now, and beyond Mars and Venus, it's understanding how to help us come back into balance, because quite often women are moving more to what we might call the masculine side, and men are moving more to the emotional feminine side, and how do we find a balance and use relationship skills to do that? And that keeps the attraction alive. Now, are you talking mostly about people who already are in relationships or people who are out there dating? Because uh, we were speaking when we were uh, off camera before the show started, you and I were speaking, and I was saying I couldn't really imagine what it's like out there dating in the Tinder world right now. I, I don't even think I would be part of the Tinder world, but so many people I know, younger and older, are out there doing Tinder almost every day and night. Um, that's got to be really different from when you wrote your first book, right? Every, every relationship is different today, whether you're in relationships or not. This book is about how men and women are hormonally different. And, for example, in the tender world, there's a lack of intimacy, and therefore there's a lack of sustained attraction. So it's moving on from one to another. Uh, quick sex, for example, stimulates different hormones than actually forming a relationship that you, where you can bond. But even in marriage, what's happening is the attraction is dissipating, couples are falling apart, divorce is high, couples are living together, not getting married. All of these are challenges today because in our complex world, everything's going faster, and that stimulates different hormones and it raises stress hormones. And, and we're unable to effectively communicate. So couples are just, instead of growing in love and, and harmony, they're, they're actually growing apart, either through conflict or lack of passion or interest. What do you think about this? I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and I said, you know, I just don't think, in terms of evolution, I don't think we've evolved as, as, a, as people as quickly enough um, to keep up with the technology that's going on. Therefore, everyone is always in a rush to try and finish their work, to try and meet the next person, to try and do what it is they're supposed to be doing. And I just don't think hormonally men or women are, can even keep up with that. So we're always in well, some kind of race. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think you hit it on the nail. That's a major part of the you know content, which is life is faster than it used to be. That stimulates the hormone testosterone. And testosterone actually is good for men. Men need 30 to 40 times more testosterone than women. And it, but unfortunately, uh, for women, a high testosterone rushing around and so forth lowers their estrogen levels and depletes their body of progesterone. Progesterone makes the testosterone. And so they run out of the female hormones. So women's stress levels are higher. At the same time, with the fast pace of life, men are able to cope better with that in terms of stress, but the rebuilding time to rebuild the testosterone he uses up takes more downtime, and women are looking for more attention and affection and so forth to stimulate the female hormones, and he tends to go more to his cave and pull away, or he tends to go too far to his female side, because when men don't have training and confidence or success in a fast-paced world, the biology is such that it, it, the, there's an enzyme that gets re released called aromatase that converts a man's testosterone into estrogen, and he becomes hyper-emotional, irritated, annoyed, angry, 
And what he doesn't realize at those times when he starts to talk about his emotions, it actually increases estrogen, lowers his testosterone, which has all these devastating effects for men. Men need 30 times more. If they don't, they're depressed, they get heart attacks, they get uh, you know prostate cancer. All these problems happen when men's testosterone levels are out of balance. So relationships can help us to come back in balance, but it's a whole new set of skills. You know, I notice, and I've done talking with friends of mine that are going through all kinds of things uh, in life, and a lot of times um, their partners don't even want to sit down and talk about stuff. They're like, ah, it's fine. And I've noticed that just, I don't know, among the circles that I'm in. Why would that be? A lot of people just don't even want to go there and talk about some of the issues. Well, that goes back to the basic book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, is women want to talk because it stimulates the hormone estrogen and that lowers their stress. It's a biological necessity for women to talk about feelings. And for men, the biological necessity is to solve problems. So if she's bringing up issues, he wants to jump right to the solution. Or if he doesn't see there's a solution, let's forget it, let's not worry about it, let's put it away. And this breaks, this is a phenomena that as stress levels rise, it doesn't give women the, the, the support they need. And if men can learn, and that's what I teach men, is how to listen and be engaged uh, without taking things personally. Uh, otherwise, couples get in arguments, or he just withdraws, and she feels he's not interested. And he's not interested until he, he understands why, biologically, women need to talk about things that will actually increase their estrogen. And it may even be irrational what she says. It doesn't have to be rational, but they will shift the hormones, and then she'll come back to a very clear place of appreciation. But women aren't getting that, and the need for that is greater today than ever before because talking about feelings and things is something that stimulates estrogen. And when women are doing the, you know, the man job all day long, the traditional male roles, making money, working for money, etc., that stimulates testosterone and not estrogen. So there needs to be a balance. So women today have a greater need to communicate, and when they don't feel safe to do it, then they stay stuck on their male side and they feel overwhelmed and then they don't even feel the need to talk about it. So there's two categories. You can call it Venus in pink. She's wanting to talk about it. Then there's Venus in blue. She's just like a man. You know, she's busy all the time, but she can't sleep at night. Her hormones are out of balance. She goes to doctors to take hormones to try to find peace of mind. Taking hormones throws her body even further out of balance because the body's designed to make them, not take them. Okay, so... Why don't a lot of men want to talk? I mean, do they just come home and they're, they're exhausted? They don't really want to do it. They're hoping that a lot of problems go away. What can a man do? What can a woman do? You say uh, things have changed a lot from when you wrote your first book. Um, so much is different. Let's say let's talk about um, a couple that's already in a relationship. What can they do to sort of come together in the middle so that they each understand each other? Well, the first, you cover a lot of ground there. Men don't want to talk. Why would a man not want to talk when he doesn't want to talk? And let me point out, some men listening talk too much, and their wives are saying he talks too much. That's the new phenomena that's occurring. But the more traditional male-female relationship, the guy is basically making testosterone and using it up all day long. When he comes home, he needs some alone time, some relaxation time to rebuild that testosterone. If he doesn't feel successful at home while he's taking his what you might call me time or cave time, then he doesn't rebuild it. He needs to feel successful. Now, the flip side of this, if his wife is stressed, he's not going to feel successful. He's, he, he, and, and for her to cope with her stress, what women have to learn is how to share feelings without blaming their partner. Often the feelings build up and it just gets projected on their partner as opposed to sharing feelings about her day and asking him, just listen, don't say anything, just listen. Men don't need to talk about it to feel better, and the men who think they do, they're too far on their estrogen side, and they need to learn how to listen more and talk less. So okay. we've got two categories can, can I Can I quote you? They need to <laughs> learn how to listen more and talk less. Would you say that for me again? I'm going to bring that message home. And I'm going to bring it to a lot of my friends, in fact, who are, uh, you know, just struggling with all sorts of things with the men uh, in their lives, whether they're dating them or married to them. I just think a lot can be accomplished if people just listen to each other. And this goes for the women, too. You need to sit down and, and listen to what the guy's got to say. Usually the guy will just say, I want to my private time but i get that too but i think a woman takes on generally more roles because you're right women are working today they're dealing probably more with the kids than the guys are and um you know more with the house than the guy is so they may even have a little more stress um i don't know but it's not may it's proven they do have more stress and women 
when they're making testosterone all day, they need extra support when they come home and talking about their feelings in a safe zone with their partners just listening. And, and some of these men, they get argumentative, they want to interrupt, they want to solve the problem. The thing is, encourage her to talk, make it safe, say, tell me more, what else? Help me understand that better. These are like key factors that can help draw her out because when women can talk more, if they take the time to do it, and many women today won't take the time to do it, one, because their husbands don't know how to listen, or two, because they're just overwhelmed and don't want to come back to their female side. They don't know how important that is to find their balance. They get lost into problem solving, thinking I have to do all these things. You don't have to do them. What you have to do is come back into balance where you're feeling happy and fulfilled. That's the foundation of a relationship. Let's get into people who are dating. So we all actually only have a few more minutes. People who are out there dating. Let's face it, the whole app world is very, very different than, um, you know, either going to a bar and meeting somebody, meeting somebody at work. And so many people I know, young and old, are resorting to apps to meet somebody. They show up, A, the guy or girl doesn't look at all like their picture. B, they're not really working where they say they're working. I mean, just, I don't know what's going on. Or they're just going out there and hooking up and not really having meaningful relationships. That I find to be a real problem. I, what do you think? It is a problem. It is a problem. And there's a huge pressure on women to respond sexually immediately to satisfy the man because there's so much competition. There's women pursuing men now where it used to be men pursuing women. It's so easy for men. And when it's easy for men to get laid, to put it directly, men don't bond with women. It's just like, okay, did that one move on to the next one and next one? It's when a man bonds with a woman, it has to be on several levels, not just physical, but it has to be more emotional, mental, and then he calls back. Then he pursues the relationship. But it takes some time to get to that place. You know, and, you know it, this is... But you, they have to make the effort. I mean, if they're just going to go out and, as you said, you know, use an app and get laid, there's no effort. There's no effort to take them to dinner, to go on a hike, to go to a movie, just sort of the old-fashioned dumb stuff that people do that might seem boring but really isn't because you're spending time. Even if you're just driving somewhere and parking the car, you're spending a little time and talking about your day. That's how I look at it. I tell friends of mine no, that they're – yeah, I tell my friends that and they're right. like, the that's dumb. women are encouraging it just to point out this. I mean, they're feeling like, well, I have to compete. I have – other women are so fast in easy i have to be fast and easy to get the guy's attention it's a challenging thing so what you can do a little phrase for women is when he's wanting to move in on sex and everything i love to have sex but i like to go slow then at least he doesn't feel rejected a very powerful statement which is i love to have sex with you but i have to go slow you know what then, then you get a chance to talk more and connect more and do more before you jump into everything at once i would stay off the whole app thing i mean if i were suddenly uh, out there single uh, it's not what i would do because just again well, more and more people are believing the same thing that's what i hear why aren't i a, see i them. should be a therapist just like you i seem to have all the same advice that you do you should bring me on to be one of your um one of your people to you know help <laughs> guide people don't you think i mean i i really i seem to know a lot so um <laughs> and 10 minutes of knowing you i have no idea what your advice is <laughs> oh no <laughs> you can only cover 20 minutes but what you said today is great no but good answer i'm just being silly uh tell me a yeah, little bit about yeah. your background and uh, your own situation that got you into this i know again because you've been counseling um couples but um have you well, had... I've been married 32 years. I've got three daughters, four grandchildren, and I teach around the world. I, you know, tomorrow I'm, I'm going to England, I go to Spain, I go to Russia, then I'm going to China. Everywhere around the world where women have jobs, there's a whole new set of problems in relationships. That's the challenge here today, is that when women are working nine to five or longer than that, doing jobs for money, it changes their hormones and interferes with their ability to be happy with a man and their stress levels are much higher. And when a woman's not happy, then a man ends up getting upset or distant, gives up, he loses his energy. And when a man loses his energy, he doesn't have relationship skills to help her come back to balance to her female hormones through romance, through affection, through good listening, through touch, all these things, and great bedroom skills. You know, this is all changing today. We have no model in history how to sustain romantic relationships when women are living all day long in the work world or women who are staying home with their children. It's still a fast-paced world. It's, there's no precedent for this. There's just stress and higher levels of stress that gives rise to breast cancer, prostate cancer, all these sicknesses that we're having today. A big part of that is a lack of relationship skills that can actually help lower our stress. Okay, one thing I, I also want to say, um, I think it's important, and it sounds like you agree, for women to work. Because if you're just sort of sitting home all day, I mean, that's nobody can Hi, really... Catherine. 
Oh, women sorry. have never sat home all day. They've always worked. They always have other women they're working with, but it's different than working for money. When you work for money, it produces different hormones as opposed to working with and for people you love. Right. So the work is important for women because it stimulates them intellectually. But it just sounds like it, perhaps men need to become more evolved and perhaps they can just learn, if possible, to just listen. Is that what you're saying? Like if you have a man who will just listen, it helps the woman feel a little better about what's going on in her world. And then she can calm down a little bit and then they can have a better relationship moving forward is that what you're saying if yes, we could just as, get that to happen men need to, if you term use your term which i'm okay with that term evolved it is new relationship skills it's a higher level of evolution that we want to achieve which is equality is a higher state of evolution and it's not just men evolving it's women evolving learning how to share vulnerability how to share feelings without blaming their partners because the biggest problem in relationships after a while when women don't know how to communicate themselves it tends to come out as nagging and complaining rather than loving and appreciating great sex and on learning how to ask what you want and appreciate small changes but trying to change someone is not love and that's what we start doing after a while we're not getting what we want we have to learn how to give more to ourselves so that we're happy and we're not looking to our partner for everything john gray if people want to get in touch with you obviously what is your website let's and if you can uh, tell us your the name of your latest book again and do you skype with people as well if they want to talk to you and and have sessions with you do you do that as well I have a really long waiting list on counseling, so I forget about that. But I do have my website where I answer questions all the time and blogs. It's at MarsVenus.com. And so, you know, we have lots and lots of free pro programming there for people to learn about relationships. Also, how to have better health, because better health and nutrition helps the brain work better, so you have better, more libido, more energy. That's, like, really important stuff for people today is really to have is. the energy and the libido for relationships. So that's, ju that's MarsVenus.com. And the new book that you can find in bookstores, you can also find Amazon, places like that, is Beyond Mars and Venus. And if you get the book and you, put, you go to MarsVenus.com, you can just put the receipt number in and you'll get a two-hour download of uh, streaming of Secrets of Great Sex because I also think – sexual skills are just as important as communication skills and most people are not updated with that as well hell yeah i mean let it go and um i agree with you 100 percent. so thanks for adding that in as well that's very very important to any relationship so john gray thank you so much for being on with us today i enjoy talking to you it's a real honor to talk to you and um hopefully we can have you back again oh it's a real pleasure thank you yeah and travel safely bye-bye wow he's pretty incredible Pretty incredible, ma'am. What do you think? I mean, that is a book that's a classic, yeah. right. um, and his second book is is clearly going to be uh, just as successful, if not more. So it was really, I was very, very excited to be able to talk with him. So uh, thank you to my incredible staff uh, for putting that together. And now we have another terrific, terrific guest on for you. I'm so beyond thrilled to have her uh, calling in. Catherine, are you there? I am. How oh, are you, Deborah? Yay. Catherine Switzer. Am I pronouncing your name properly? Absolutely correct. That's what you are. Okay. Now, you need to know something about me. I completed the L.A. Marathon this year, so marathoner to marathoner, that's how uh, th this conversation is going to go. <laughs> um, oh, great. However, I'd say you have well, a little... congratulations on that. Thank you so much, but you've got a little more on me, that's for sure. Your, your story is so, so fascinating. Um, for those people who don't know... Catherine is the woman. Do we have pictures of her when this happened? Okay, back in, what was it, 1967, Catherine became the first woman to run the Boston Marathon. Your number was 261. And you signed in as you used the initials, right? You used your first initial and your last name. Is that correct? Correct. K.V. Switzer. K.V. Switzer. So nobody really knew that you were a woman, and at the time, women were not running in the marathon and this was the boston marathon again in 1967 and the race official jock semple am i saying that correctly yes he came into the race when he saw you and shoved you tried to shove you out of the race in which case your boyfriend at the time tom am i getting these names correctly he sounds good so far okay well this is your story let's see if i get it right um, at the time came to your defense, but as time went on throughout that race, 
it became more and more difficult. Uh, Tom, the boyfriend, was worried about what he was doing because of his own Olympic aspirations. Uh, the coach, Arnie, that you had trained with over at Syracuse uh, stayed up with you the whole time until you finished at the end. The press was somewhat heckling you. And in my opinion, this is a story not really of being pushed out of the race, but getting to the finish line and all the emotions and the strength that it took just to get there and then the life lessons in that one day. Did I get that right? You, it's just amazing. Um, we always say, Deborah, that you go through a life experience every time you run a marathon, and perhaps that ex happened to you when you were running Los Angeles, but certainly for a girl of 20 who simply wanted just to run her own first marathon and encountered all of these difficulties and challenges and prevailed and went on and finished despite all that, it was definitely not only going through a lifetime, but it was changing my life for the rest of my life. And, and it did do that. It was just amazing. Isn't it amazing that in life, one incident that you really didn't, you know, you were a girl who liked to run. So Coach Arnie took you under his wing over at school and said, come on, run with me. And then uh, I think it was you who gave him the challenge about doing the Boston Marathon. You signed up, I believe, three days before it started or three weeks, something like that. And you just went for it, right? You just went for it. And then when you're there, well, certainly I don't think you expected this to happen, correct? No, it's, it's, it's a better story than that, actually, with, oh, with all please. due respect. No, <laughs> it's, it is, go at it. it is <laughs> I, well, here we go. I was a, uh, a student at Syracuse University. I, I was a runner. I had been running since I was 12. But there were no sports at Syracuse University for women. Men had all these big scholarships. I went out and began training with the men's team where I was received wonderfully by these guys. One has to say always that men in running were wonderful. And one of them was this guy, Arnie, who was the, a volunteer coach there. He was 50, and he had run the Boston Marathon. And as we jogged together every day, he would tell me stories about the Boston Marathon and really kind of regaled me with how this was the one day in his life when he felt like a hero in his life. Really? Certainly running always since the age of 12, it empowered me hugely and made me really um, have the, the fearlessness to try many new things and to take on challenges. And I wanted to be a sports writer. That's why I was at Syracuse University. Right. That's you were a journalism major. Right. With... Go ahead. I'm sorry. You were yeah. a journalism major. Yes, That's, go ahead. Yeah. That was a journalism major. That's why I wanted. Uh, that's why I signed my name with my initials. I wanted to be a sports writer. You know, J.D. Salinger, E.E. E. Cummings were cool. I was K.V. Switzer. Um, my dad had also misspelled my name on my birth certificate, so I was tired of it being misspelled. So <laughs> the initials came in handy. When I proved to my coach in practice, he didn't believe any woman anywhere ever could run a marathon. The myths in the 60s were about women's limitation and weakness, fr fragility. Um, also, there were fears that if you did anything arduous, you'd become a man. You would take on manly qualities. You know, oh, my God. Your chest. You, yeah, your, your uterus would fall out. These were all the myths that prevailed. So women didn't really gravitate towards sports, and, um, and, and they were afraid of them, and they were afraid of challenges. So... Um, I love to run. You know, as I said, I'd been running since I was 12. It, it was, I was encouraged by my parents to do it because they saw how empowered I felt by it. And, and so when I heard about the marathon, of course, I wanted to try. My coach, as I said, didn't believe any woman anywhere could, despite the fact that in history, many, not many, about eight women had run a marathon, including one at Boston the year before. She jumped out of the bushes and ran. But, but um, he didn't believe that. My coach just didn't believe it. So when I challenged him on it, he said, well, if you showed me in practice um, that you could do it, I'd be the first person to take you. So hot diggity, I had a challenge and a coach, and I um, proved to him in practice that one day not only did we run 26 miles, we actually ran 31. I wanted to make sure no matter what I could do this. I loved what you and said to him. I love that you, were, you, did, you got to the 26, because I read up on, on you, and you said, let's keep going. And I'm thinking, in your mind, even though you were only 19 or 20, you were thinking, I'll show him I can do this. Like, almost like you were challenging him and saying, let's keep going. In which case, he must have been in shock, but he did it, right? He was absolutely in shock because yeah. he was very tired, and I was feeling really great. We were actually discovering something then that's, that's playing out in a very big way in women's sports right now, which is that women actually have more endurance and stamina than men. We don't have the speed and the power, but we have the endurance, stamina, flexibility, and balance. And so the longer the, the event got, the better, and training session, the better I got relative to all the men. 
so there was a great equalizing point at about, you know, at about 15, 18 miles. And then certainly at 26, I was feeling better than him. And when I said, let's go for another five to make sure we can finish Boston, he fainted at the end of the workout. And he was so impressed that he helped me sign up for the race. Well, in a way, the rest is history because what happened is, is, is we were trying to follow the rules, which meant that you had to enter the race, pay your entry fee, you know, just like you did in Los Angeles. You get your bib number, um, you sign up, and then you go. And there was nothing about gender in the rule book or on the entry form. And I said, well, why, why haven't other women signed up for the races? And he said, I don't know. It's because they're probably afraid and they just want to, to jump in. He said, but you can't do that. You have to sign up. This is the serious race. So when I was in the race wearing a bib number, that's when the official lost his temper and attacked me because he thought I was making a mockery of his race. And I thought I had been following the rules. So there was this great collision course. Can I ask you and a question? My, why would you yeah, be mocking sure. why would you be mocking the race by having a bib on? Because no because other he, woman had done it before? I was, he thought I had pulled a fast one on him. He thought I had fraudulently entered the race just so that I could flaunt it and wear a bib number. Um, guys all the time were wearing Eat at Joe's Bar and Grill or they were hung over from a fraternity party at Harvard and they, they wanted to see who could lead the race the longest, the first, and be on television. And he thought I was just another one of those clowns. And my coach was screaming at her, him, saying, leave her alone, she's okay. I'm right, and they, they knew each he, other, correct? They did. They knew each other, Because they used yeah. to run in races together many years before. But my boyfriend didn't wait for any kind of reply. He just decked the official and knocked him out of the race instead. Right. He's a big and, football and guy, I, right? Was he a football he guy? Was a, yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah, big football <laughs> guy. Like, you aren't going to get past Tom. So, But what I found yeah. interesting and um, was that throughout the race, after Tom then decked that official, he thought about it and thought, oh, no, what did I do? And then he started, if you will, berating you somewhat and saying, hey, uh, now you're going to ruin my career at the Olympics. Look what you did to me. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. As I'm reading this the other night, I'm thinking, geez, this woman just wants to get to the end of the finish line. All this stuff, she's getting shoved. Now the boyfriend's mad at her. Oh, my goodness. So, right? I mean, what we, what was going through I, your mind? Well, what was going through my mind was first after the attack t took place, I was kind of annoyed with my boyfriend for decking him. Uh, I thought maybe we could have talked him out of it, but we couldn't have. He was the d official was out of control. There was yeah. just no question. He was in a complete tantrum. My boyfriend decked him, and I thought, oh gosh, that's not what I would have done. I would have just tried to run away from him. But of course, I couldn't get away. He had me by the shirt. Anyway, Ugh. this was all took place in front of the press truck. So the pictures of this incident were being flashed around the world, and of course, my boyfriend, who was aspiring to the Olympic team, then realized, look, I've decked this official. I'm in deep trouble. Um, I'm going to be thrown out of the, the Federation. I'm never going to make an Olympic team because of you. And then he got mad at me. And I was the one who told him not to come to Boston. He was a football player, for God's sakes. He wasn't a runner. And he, then my boyfriend said, well, you run too slow anyway. And he took <laughs> off. And I thought, oh, cheapers, there goes this relationship. Um, <laughs> and, and, of course, halfway, you know, he weighed, he weighed 235 pounds and had never trained more than a mile in his life. I passed him. In the race, and I said, "Look, Yay. I'm sorry, I gotta go." And he said, "Oh, come on, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't have left me. you, right? I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't leave you." <laughs> so an hour and a half, but an hour and a half later, he finished. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you gotta yeah. hand it to the guy. <laughs> but I have to say, then you get to the finish line, and your life was never going to be the same again, right? I mean, ever. And you didn't realize it because really, all you wanted to do was run. And now, look what you've done for women. I mean, also. How many years ago now? It's 50 years that this has happened, right? 50. 50 years. So let's go ahead 50 years, where I believe now there may be more women signing up for the marathons, many of the marathons. Is that correct? Yes, it's really great. I've, and, and, you know, I spent my life, you know, the marathon, that event changed my life, of course. I, I knew by the time I finished it that I really was going to try to change the system and get opportunities for women and, and, and created, for instance, a, 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 this took many years, but created a global program of races for women only where they were not intimidated and welcomed and went, eventually had 400 races in 27 countries. 
for over a million women and gathered the data and statistics from these to present to the International Olympic Committee and got the women's marathon included officially in the Olympic Games in 1984, which was a huge blow for women's equality in sports. It was massive. That Absolutely. Was, that was a game changer. Absolutely. But, but – Go the ahead. bottom line to me was, you know, creating the empowerment, the sense of empowerment and self-esteem that, that running gives. And here we are 50 years later, um, 58% of all the runners in the United States are now women. It's, it's almost a women-driven sport because they're also leading a multi-billion dollar apparel and shoe and travel industry with, with all these events. Same in Canada, same in France, same in Japan now. So it's going global. And... Um, Ten days ago, or two weeks ago, rather, I ran the Boston Marathon again 50 years later, um, you know, to celebrate these amazing changes, which are not, nothing short of the social revolution, and also then to cast ahead a look to see where we're going to go for the next 50 years. I won't be around in 50 years, but what happened uh, on the streets of Boston two weeks ago when I ran again, and uh, by the way, only woman who's ever done that, um, run 50 years after she ran her first marathon. Well, when I, when I um, realized when you ran it and that you ran it again, I thought, wait a minute, that's, that's just incredible because A, you're 70 years old, you sure don't look it, and B, you're still in such incredible shape, um, but I guess you've run for much of your life. This is part of who you are. Um, but a couple questions because I'm going to have to let you go in a few moments. You have a nonprofit, Two Six One Fearless, correct? Um, that you were yes, talking about. Yeah, go ahead. Name, named after my bib number of that course. the official tried to pull off. Of course, the number suddenly became organically among men and women, but mostly women, meaning a number meaning fearless in the face of adversity. It's true. From that, we created a nonprofit which uses running as the vehicle to empower women globally. Because most women in the world still live in a fearful situation. Most women in the world still do. And I and think that's women only... everywhere. I think a lot of women yeah. feel like they don't have a voice. I think that's more common than people would know, and they hide it. Um, and I think it's very important for people to try um, and support each other and become fearless if, if they can, if possible, if they have the strength Absolutely. to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, Deborah, it, it, you, you think, oh, is this a woman in Afghanistan? Yeah, maybe, but it's also maybe the woman lives next door to you. Oh yeah. And she doesn't she feels powerless and honest to God, if she puts on a pair of sneakers and puts one foot in front of the other, she can gain her own sense of feeling of empowerment and self esteem. Easy, cheap, totally accessible, non judgmental, you know, go for it. It's a lot of fun. But two six one fearless dot org, uh, my foundation, reaches out to women all over the world. We're creating global clubs. Um, community clubs in different places in the world where women can uh, join together, be together as a, a women's non-judgmental community, walk and run together, share the secrets of their soul, um, and they'll get that sense of empowerment. Also, they can communicate on our website. You sometimes just need to know you're not alone out there. Catherine, and, and uh, honestly, I'd like to become really involved works. in that. I really would. So if you don't mind, I'd like to get in touch with you myself personally. Because, um, sure. again, very briefly, I ran the marathon. I didn't, I didn't run it. I walked the marathon this year. I had never done anything like that, ever. Because I was walking one day in my neighborhood, and people were handing out water to runners. And I was thirsty. And I said, can I have some water? And they gave me the water. And I said, what's this for? And the man said, well, these people are training for the marathon. I said, oh. And he said, why don't you do it? I said, What? And this was just about three months before the L.A. Marathon. And believe me, I'd never done anything even close to it. But I am a walker, and I like to hike. And I said, um, okay. And I just signed up. And I was walking that day because I was, having, I was struggling. I was having a really tough day having lost my parents in recent years. And it's just always a struggle sometimes. So I walk it off. So I completed the marathon this year walking it because I'm not much really of a runner because of my asthma. And the, I felt so empowered because of it. So... There is something to this. I mean, a marathon, a half marathon, whatever you're capable of doing, it's a goal. And if you feel like you can't do it, you can try and push yourself. Just like you said, get a pair of sneakers and walk. I have, a, I have something, and I say this to my kids a lot. Put on a pair of sneakers, go for a walk, grab some water, and get a banana and get out the door. And they get so mad at me. They're like, Mom. But it's true, right? You just have to put one foot in front of the other. And it's look at you 50 years later. Look what it did for you, right? It's incredible. 
Well, and, and when you change your own life, you change other people's lives. Yeah. And, and, you know, you empower women, you're going to change the world. It has to start with, uh, with us. I mean, we've got to do something. And basically, yeah, it, it's something that not only created my career and my religion and my husband and all the relationships I have, it really gave me back myself. Yeah. And as you say, you had a tough time dealing with your parents. You walk it off. I have been through the divorce, grief, everything. Um, and, and creativity and spontaneity and, and the sense of, of, of capability all comes to me when I'm out there putting one foot in front of the other. Absolutely. There, there are real physiological reasons for this. It may be the endorphins, it's the brain, uh, the oxygen over the brain, the synapses connect better. Basically, it works. And yeah. I'm not interested in analyzing it too much because it absolutely does work. I think the amazing thing is, is we can take that same sense to women who have nothing, who have no sense of opportunity or can't even get out of the house by themselves or drive a car or get an education we know it works we can change those lives yeah and i'd like to community. i really would like to get involved in this so i'm going to get in touch with you and uh in the meantime um you've got a book out and i think it's the second edition isn't that correct of marathon it, woman well, the, yeah it's a third edition of marathon third edition. woman and um, it's a celebratory edition for my running the boston marathon two weeks ago 50 years on a real testimony, actually, to longevity and, and good luck and good genes and fitness. But the point is this, is if you, if you exercise on a regular basis, that is one of the healthiest things you can do. I'm doing some work with Humana now on active aging, and that's really, really the way to keep your health uh, for a long time is to stay active. So I, I push that a lot. Yeah. But Thank Marathon you. Marathon Woman, yes, I'm thrilled with the book. and. Um, uh, and I'll be working on another one this year uh, about the future. Good, and we'll have you back, and I'll get in touch, if you don't mind, about all the good work you're doing with the um, with the nonprofit. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. It's a real honor to have you on the show with us today, Catherine Switzer. Great, Thank Deborah. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. She was outstanding. Such an honor to talk to these two yeah. incredible people today, right? Yeah, Men are from Mars, women from Venus, a marathon runner, the first woman to be shoved out of the Boston Marathon, yeah. and 50 years later, she runs it again. Very uplifting. It, it really, really is. And yeah. I know my own story with the marathon, and I'd love to encourage people to do anything. Um, and now we have someone even more incredible. So thank you for being patient. I hope you've enjoyed our little uh, dialogue today in studio. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're such a patient man. Oh, of course. But, I mean, uh, following up those two, is, that's this going to be difficult. Oh, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Not with what you've got here in studio. So thank you, Colin. Colin or Col Colin? Colin. Colin Marshall, yeah. your VP of Phantom in Industries? Or? Phantom. Okay, Phantom Inc., yes. of Phantom. And we met at the Grammy Gifting Suite. And the G Grammy Gifting Suite, for those who don't know, um, the people who are presenters, is that correct? That's or right. Who performers and presenters. Performers well. right. and presenters at the Grammys get a boatload of cool stuff. And this is one of the cool stuff that was there. And I really, I, I focused and I honed in on it because I loved it. Now, um, have you been reading about Fabio? You know, Fa everybody knows Fabio, the I can't believe it's not butter guy, right, that yeah, kind of, of handsome guy. Of course, yeah. uh, my husband does a talk show here in Los Angeles and around the country, and Fabio was on his show the other day because he's one of the celebrities, one of the many of them who got robbed recently. And there are so many in Los Angeles, for example, and everywhere, uh, you know, robberies are on the on the rise. So and many. Yeah, that's They right. really are. Now, we have an incredible uh, security system in our house, but it can never be. It, there's always, like, a, another version of, of how to make yourself safer. This I loved because I thought it was simple. I thought it was easy, and I thought it was smart. And do you mind? You brought a little bit of the product with you today. I did, yeah. To tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, first it was all, great. It's, it's great to you be here. You were my favorite there, I got to say. You and, and one of the artists. I thought he was incredible. So, oh, uh, very, yeah. that's thanks very, for being very here. cool. Yeah, thanks. Well, it's nice to be here. Obviously, I'm from Chicago, so I left, I think, 43 degrees and raining, so it's always wonderful oh. to be here as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, not, not too difficult. But, yeah, so I brought Umi. And Umi, spell Umi. this, lift it up a little yep. bit so so the people can see. So o -O Umi, O O M I, o -O -M -I. interesting name. Interesting name. Yep. Uh, we it's there's a whole backstory to that that if we have time. Yeah, if we have time, you'll tell me yeah, that one. But I really want to make sure we get your product in and what it is and what it does. Exactly. Because it's easy. 
It so is easy. So, on the, up. so the idea behind this is you mentioned security, right? Yeah. Obviously, there is a security component in this. Uh, this is UmiCube, and it in and of itself has a camera with night vision, as well as motion sensors and other environmental detections. And where would you put this? You would put this. You would put this in a central part in the home. In the home, okay. Within the home, yep. It's so inside the home, not weatherproof. So you want to have this inside the house, and you want to okay. have this in a location where it's going to be doing. Uh, it's got a good line of sight to whatever you deem to be most important. Okay. Um, so front door, back door, or maybe just a main living area. Okay. Uh, the idea behind it is that, like I said, with the integrated motion sensor, you can receive alerts when you're not at home if something is detected that now, you don't expect it this to. This is if someone already broke into your home, then this can help with that, or. Right. So there's there's actually a whole scheme of devices here that can create sort of a barrier to your home. So okay. door and window sensors. Uh, motion sensors, multi-sensors. What do you do if you have pets though? Because I had to turn my motion sensors off at a certain level. Of course, I'm telling people this and they probably they could break in and then crawl around my home, but not really because I've not still really. got it set up. So don't even think about it. Well, you have the but door and window sensors anyway, right? I have everything. So have oh my God. Right. So I covered. have, you you're can't covered. even, every skylight, I mean, uh, the double, triple done, I'm, you know, they can't even get past a certain area and it's going to go off. And That's right. Yeah. But the idea behind this, and actually, you know, not to segue too much from the previous guest, but the idea behind this is that it's very empowering because it is so simple. It, yeah. Anybody who, even if you're a technophile and you're sort of scared of, you know, setting up Wi-Fi networks and things like that, you don't have to worry about that with UMI because everything that we do oh, for cool. setting up is simply just tap and touch. So these two orange dots, I don't know if we can see it on the camera here. Yeah. You okay. literally make them meet and then it detects immediately what's ready to go on your system. So any of our devices, whether it's UMI Cube or the motion sensors, door window sensors. So the, you've got the door window sensors. That's you've right. got the cube for the motion. Cube What's, and camera motion. Cube and, and camera yep. motion. What else? We have uh, door window sensors. Now, of course, beyond security, we have other things because UMI is about more than just security. It's about ambiance and mood and making things cool. So we have RGB, 16 million color light bulbs, including three shades of white. And also the color strip does the same thing. So you can really. So you're saying like you can have like a psychedelic um, totally. room in your living room and it's going to like, like you're on an LSD trip or something? I don't get it. Like, yeah, so exactly. Show so me. this is one of oh. our bulbs right here. So I just turned it on. Uh, oh, so you can turn it on from that as well. You turn it on from Umi Touch. That's right. So, and then you can create, you know, cool little scenes. So like. I've okay, I'm a having UB, a really I've cool party UBN on scene. Friday. That <laughs> you can kind of be like the Statue of Liberty too. That's right. So, um, no, but I'm having a really fun party on um, Friday night. That would be really cool. So it would just change colors. That's right. Can exactly. it go from one to the next? So you can actually create a scene party. Oh, and it's wow. so easy. So w regardless of what you want to do, you want to have your music going, you want to have your lights going, just create a party scene. Now, let's say I'm away. Can I set this up and see what's going on in my house? Right. So, of course, this is for in-home kids. kids. Exactly. This is for in-home control. The three of you. Watch it. Yeah, uh, go ahead. <laughs> I, would, I would pull up my own home, but my kids are at school right now and show you exactly what we're talking about. So my kids are always like, Dad, d is Umi watching me right now? And, I'm, and I basically tell them I'll never let them know. <laughs> hell no. You no. Can't, hell yeah. You yeah. can't go telling kids like they're on camera. They'll go somewhere else and they'll, do what they're doing. They'll yeah. always know. So whether they are or aren't, I won't let them know that. Mm -hmm. But it is a great way to check in on them, particularly when you're on the road or you're away, or even if just peace of mind, whether it's your pet. Or you know what? You just want to see what's going on at home. You know, I would like to put that on my pet all day and just see what the heck he does when he's roaming around and what he's thinking when he's going into the basement when I didn't he shouldn't. I didn't actually mean putting it on your pet. Yeah, I know, I know. But <laughs> <laughs> you're giving me ideas, okay? Well, that's it's fine. <laughs> you know, that's the nice thing about Umi. You can kind of do whatever you want. Be creative know. with that's it. That's right. Be creative. Have do some fun. Do you have a system that's also for the outdoors? Or could I also install that sort of on a porch? Would it be weatherproof enough for that? Yeah, I mean, if it's if we have elements here that if it's not getting directly rained upon or something like that, it's certainly okay to use in uh, the conditions outside. But if it's going to receive direct rain, we don't have devices for that. But the nice part about UMI is that we can add devices that aren't UMI. Now, it's not as simple to do that, but you can add non-UMI devices to your system. So that's they great. They might be outdoor and they might be ready to go. Exactly. So it's, it's capable to do that as well. If you have an outdoor system, perhaps integrate UMI into that system or... If you integrate UMI, if you have UMI first and integrate a system into that, that's right, right and other devices, right? So yeah. we use an underlying, not to get too techy here, that's because okay. that's not what we're about, right? We don't want to be techy. Yeah, you want to make it easy for we people like me, easy. okay? But there is a communication underlying communication called Z-Wave that we use. So any device that Z-Wave inside, yeah. you can pair to UMI. So like a door lock, we're not going to make a door lock. That's not, you know, that's not in UMI's repertoire. Right. But Schlag or Quickset or one of these other ones that have a Z-Wave lock, you can add to your system. 
So now you can remotely unlock or lock your doors from the UMI app using a, a Schlag lock. Wow. Yeah, it's fun. That's really, really cool. Now, what's this plug? You've got a plug there. What is? Yes. Yeah, so, how is this plug different than other plugs? So this plug is different in a couple of ways. Number one, like I said, it's just it literally is plug and play. So you take the plug out, you tap it against Umi Touch, it's ready and on your system. I love that you can just tap just it. Just tap it. That's, That's it. That's so cool. That is total idiot proof. It, it pretty much. I mean, is, big time idiot, idiot proof. proof. You just go like that and. Bingo. My, my and you know I think my kids are pretty smart. Most parents do, right? Yeah. But my my trial run is to have my kids set this up. They're both ten, and if they can do it, I'm like, okay. Oh, a ten year old would know how to do this like that. Your challenge okay, you're with right, somebody like me, <laughs> I'm the challenge, not a ten year old. So if I can do it, you got it going. And I did do it. I mean, you when I was it. yeah, That's when right. I was over at the Grammy Suite, it was very very easy. You just tap and right. do it. So. so this plug, you literally just tap it, get it on your system, and then plug it into an outlet. And then it turns that ordinary dumb outlet into a smart outlet. So it will do a couple of things. Obviously, you have remote control now. So over a lamp or a fan or something that you plug in there, you can control remotely through Umi Touch or through your app. But the other cool thing this does is, is uh, real-time energy monitoring. Oh. So for people who are really into energy efficiency, they can now monitor uh, the use of energy real time, and they can monitor that right on Umi Touch. What do you mean the use of energy through a plug or, or through this through this plug? So if you, whatever device you plug into it, it would know how much energy that device is drawing. I think that's fantastic. I would use that, and I would use it for all different products to just sort of get a get an idea. Exactly, and you know it's interesting for kids too. It's sort of a great way, particularly with this generation, to educate them on things like cons conservation and what they're using because I, I don't know if you're like me but I'm constantly on them turn your lights off turn your lights off turn this off now I, I grew up that way we couldn't we could hardly afford the electric bill so right? I grew up like I walked through a room off went the light so That's right. and my kids are like that too <laughs> I train them that way so um, I love this one I but love now this you can show them real time and actually this LED strip I don't know if this is very an LED cool. strip on it it will actually change colors as you draw more power so you'll get a visual cue from green to yellow to red and you know like something is really drawing a lot of power very quickly you said because we have a few minutes tell me a little bit about the backstory on how you how you got into this and developed it and you said there's a, a backstory to the name of the company Sure. Well, it, the name, <laughs> it's probably not as interesting, but it was actually uh, a collective of our, our core management crew. Oh, that's and nice. And we were going to CES one year. Mm -hmm. And we were literally, what, um, we had CES, CES is? the Consumer Electronics Show in Las okay. Vegas, the biggest one for yeah. our industry. It's fun. Right? It's yeah. a really fun one. For people who just want to go, it's super cool. It's so pretty ahead. overwhelming. Yeah. But we were literally about to go to the show. We had all of our branding done, and we realized that we were running into a potential IP trademark issue. So, Oops. Potential trademark infringement. So we literally had to change the name in about a 48-hour window. Okay, and so, that's what you came up with. So we went with this. And then Umi, the two O's together, are sort of that tap and touch coming together. So it's the two O's, the dots coming together, and then adding on to that. How is this different from other systems, though? Yep. Because there are other systems out there. Tell us why people should be going out and buying this one. First of all, it's, it's pretty reasonable. It's pretty reasonable. Most importantly, the key differentiator is number one are the setup. Nothing, yeah. nothing else Simple. sets up. Nothing else sets up like this. Touch it. Can you Tap. put it? Can is there an app where you can put on your phone as well? Yeah, you have the phone app as well. So you have the in-home controller. Most systems don't come with this. And then over on this side, we have the tactile buttons. This is where you can actually program existing remote controls into this and have Umi control your entertainment devices, so oh. like your existing TV and things like that. Oh, I could use that. And you know, you, and you can you can just put this on the wall as well. And I like the stand is really nice and it's yeah, very so this sleek. Char this charges. Yeah. Yeah. I would pull it off, but as you can see, it grips pretty well. So yeah. the, and it's magnetic, uh, just you know, easy and charges your touch while you've got it on display. And how can people get this? So we are right now at umi.com taking yeah. pre-orders, and we are shipping like within month, uh, end of May, first of June. And you get all of this, and what's the price of this if they pre-order? Well, these are just some of the accessories. What you will get in the starter kit is the Umi plug. Two of the Umi bulbs, which are the, like I said, 60 million colors if you can do it, plus the three shades of white. Umi Touch, and of course, Umi Cube, which is the super multifunctional hub. And very, accessory. very cool. And I'm getting the cue to wrap up. Tell me yeah. uh, the website. Oh, Umi, O O M I dot com. O O M I dot com. Please go and order one. I think these are really cool. I'm going to do the same, and I actually can't wait to test this thing out. This is very cool. So I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, will, will you sort of keep us in touch uh, about 100%. how it goes once you really get this whole thing launched? Yeah, too? and more, more exciting stuff on the way. So we'll definitely keep oh, you posted. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Great, Colin. Thanks. Thank you so much thank for you. being here. Umi. Okay, Umi. thanks. And everybody, we'll see you next week. It's been a really fun show. See you next week for Deborah Cobalt Live. Bye-bye.